Yes, very good. You're very good at writing, that's for sure. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's actually very nice to see the people take an interest, so that's great. So we'll uh, finish off the questions from uh, yesterday, and we'll move on to the ones from today here and see what happens. <coughs> All right, so, uh, Dimati, what is the similarity, and what is the difference between Kamma, Kamma Chanda and Tanha? Uh, is the desire to kill oneself part of Tanha? Is the desire to experience the bliss of the fourth jhana part of Tanha? Uh, thank you for this wonderful energy and good mood in the midst of samsara. Um, so, uh, uh, Kamma Chanda is the... Uh, a first hindrance, right? It's called karma chanda, means desire for the five senses or desire in the realm of the five senses. Uh, and tanha is basically a craving, and craving is defined the way it is defined in the second noble truth. There's three kinds of craving. Uh, there's the craving for the five uh, senses, a uh, five sense world, uh, and then there's the craving for existence and the craving for. Uh, uh, annihilation, yeah, three kinds of craving that is mentioned there. So they are very closely related. One is a bit more related just to the five senses, and, and the other one is related also to the idea of existence, existence and annihilation. Yeah. Uh, is the desire to kill oneself part of Tanha? Usually, yes. Uh, the desire to experience the fourth bliss of the fourth jhana is not part of Tanha. Um, not really, yeah, because you are dealing here with the, uh, uh, again, the five senses and the desire to exist. Uh, now you could maybe say that uh, experiencing the bliss of the fourth jhana is a kind of existence. Uh, yeah, you want to exist in a particular way, and so it is a desire in that sense, a kind of tanha. Uh, so possibly uh, it is a part of that. Uh, uh, but uh, it is not something that you really need to worry too much about. The craving that you need to worry about uh, is a lower kind of craving. Yeah. Of course, if you have a lot of craving to experience bliss on meditation, that craving itself can be a hindrance, because the craving is something that is always uh, in the future. Uh, it is something that is not present, you're not really content, and it's contentment that enables you to achieve these things. So the craving can become a problem if you crave it, especially during meditation practice. But if you're able to kind of gradually let it go as you meditate, then it shouldn't be an issue here. But it is a kind of, you know, it, there's always going to be, as I mentioned before, there's going to be some cravings in life, and some cravings are, are certainly better than others. So I'm not sure how clear that is, but anyway, that's what you are getting for now. So, uh, there you are. Okay. Uh, okay, my roommate snores. Uh, how do I deal with this using mindfulness? Uh, uh, I don't know if you can deal with using mindfulness. I'm not sure that works, you know. Maybe mindfulness is the wrong tool. So maybe, uh, I don't know what to do. Have you got some ear earmuffs or, or earplugs or something like that? And maybe that is the best way sometimes. You have to kind of be practical about these things. And what I do not recommend is ill will. Ill will is not going to be helpful. And if you do find yourself getting irritated and having ill will, then try to avoid that. Instead, try to have, you know, this is what some people are like. They can't really help at this nor. They just kind of, it happens when they go to sleep and they just kind of, I, don't, I have no idea whether I snore or not. But, uh, and it's, so this is just life sometimes, uh, and uh, sometimes you just have to have compassion. Sometimes things are like this, uh, and uh, the best way in these cases is to avoid the ill will, have compassion, have a sense of kindness, uh, and uh, yeah, and I don't, don't know what to do. Maybe get some earplugs. Maybe ask the manager, do we have some special earplugs? We do. Wow, okay, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's, I just said that out of jest, but actually you do have some earplugs, okay? See the manager, yeah? See Shell, she will be very happy to help. That's kind of my recommendation. <laughs> that's the kind of mindfulness you need. And remember, mindfulness is also about memory, so that's kind of, uh, comes in handy. Okay, dear Ajahn, thank you for the way you translate and explain the teachings for every great form. Uh, on death contemplation, his book of the body, uh, old age, old disease, old etc., and being uh, uh, b 
being to get rid of it, being a congruent, is another perception, one of gratitude and wonder for having this body as a vessel through this life, giving one's mind the opportunity to learn the Dhamma. Uh, just think with this view, I am more likely to nourish and look after this body, which I have not done until finding my path. Okay, good. Salut, salut with Mashmeta. Yes, you should certainly look after your body, and you should nourish it, and you should make the most of it. You should, you should, it's not about hating the body. Uh, the, um, all of these perceptions are really there to gain more of a neutral perception of the body uh, because we tend to be too obsessed with the body. That's really the problem in the world. Uh, yeah, you look at people, they are obsessed with the body. Uh, so uh, gratitude and wonder for having this body as a vessel. Uh, I mean, you, you, I mean, if you didn't have the body, you would still have a vessel, some other kind of vessel, right? So it's not uh, the body is uh, just, uh, just the body. Uh, uh, just uh, have a neutral feeling for the body. Yeah, look after it because uh, uh, I guess in a sense it is a vessel. Because uh, as a human being, you have to um, y you need the body to live as a human being, and uh, so you want to spend this life as well as you possibly can on the path. And you obviously have to look after the body to some extent. So you can look at it that way if you like. Yeah? And especially if you have a negative. Uh, idea of the body, then you have to be careful not to do things that can kind of make that worse. So that is certainly the point, uh, certainly a good point. So, um, yeah, yeah, so try that if that works for you. Good. Dear Ajahn, sorry for going back for a question of yesterday's teaching. I understand you're saying experiencing the feeling and experiencing the mind parts of Satipatthana should be done mindfully. Please can you explain how to do this? Uh, so this is the uh, thing in the, sati, in the Anapanasati Sutta, right? Uh, so you are, first of all, you have the long breath, the short breath, the long breath, the full breath, and then the calming the breath. Uh, and then you start to experience feelings, uh, yeah? And at this point, you are already very, very mindful. So you are aware of those feelings in the mind, uh, the piti, the sukha, uh, the mental processes and then calming the mental processes. Uh, and that is basically what experiencing the feelings is about. Uh, yeah? At this point you're already, when you come to those feelings, if you follow the mindfulness of breathing properly, you're going to be super duper mindful already. Uh, you're going to be very clear because you have done the preliminary steps in the right way. Uh, and then when you come to the mind and you get things like uh, the nimittas and the kind of the lights coming up, you're going to be even more mindful because it's so blissful that uh, you can't avoid being mindful. Uh, even if you try not to be mindful, you're still going to be mindful. Uh, so it's kind of you are forced into mindfulness whether you like it or not. Uh, and you, I guarantee you, you will like it. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's the, remember, don't look at the Satipatthana Sutta, look instead at the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, that gives you the idea for how to, uh, how this process works. Uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, it is not as clear as it is in the Anapanasati Sutta. Dear Ajahn, the first time I ever read the Angulimala Sutta, I was amazed that someone with his background could achieve enlightenment. How was this possible? Thanks. It's possible because people are very complex. People have all kinds of qualities and uh, it's very, you have to be very careful with judging people because it's sometimes people who may seem on the surface to be uh, uh, dodgy or bad or whatever, they may turn out to be very good people deeper down. Uh, there are the superficial aspects of people and the deeper aspects of people. Uh, and uh, I sometimes I meet uh, monastics who are really good meditators, but on the surface they can seem a bit gruff, you know? <laughs> That's kind of interesting, yeah. And then there are people who are really good meditators who are really sweet and really nice people, yeah? and it's kind of very varied. It's very hard to kind of, uh, you can't pin, pin these things down, so you have to observe very carefully what are the underlying qualities, what is going on there. Yeah? So someone like Angulimala, it is said that he was, uh, uh, you know, he, someone asked him to collect these uh, fingers, uh, and so he collected them more. It wasn't because he necessarily what, enjoyed the killing, but he had to get hold of these fingers to make a garland for some reason. Uh, and then he did that. So it may not have been a, uh, the worst kind of killing, right? Uh, 
This is sort of the, um, I think, the point there. And, uh, but un underneath that killing, he had some extremely good qualities, obviously, which made it possible for him to become enlightened. Now, one of the things that we have to be good at in Buddhism is to forgive ourselves. Yeah, we make mistakes. Sometimes we make very bad mistakes. Uh, and uh, if you are, if you understand how conditioned you are by circumstances, uh, you become very good at forgiving yourself. Uh. But also remember that forgiveness is never complete. <coughs> and the reason why it is not complete is because the sense of self will always take a little bit of responsibility for what you have done. Uh. And so for that reason, just thinking that, yeah, I can do lots of bad stuff and just forgive myself afterwards, uh, please don't do that, because that doesn't work. Uh, you are, in that case, you will start blaming yourself after all. Uh, so forgiveness is not the, this kind of uh, uh, thing that works in all circumstances. Uh, so you have to be, still do your very best to live well. And then whatever remains, that is what you then forgive. Uh, but I agree, it is a remarkable story. And I think some of the, one of the things about the story is that probably it is also a bit exaggerated. Uh, Remember, these are stories. Uh, there are a number of versions of the Angulimala Sutta, and the number of people it kills is different in all the versions. Uh, so you kind of get this feeling that numbers have been inflated for effect a little bit. Uh, yeah? This is kind of very common in the suttas as well, uh, uh, because, especially because it is a story. It is not the Buddha giving a teaching. Uh, it is a narrative, and narratives uh, are, were not considered as important as the word of the Buddha. Uh, yeah, and uh, so you wonder, who remembered these narratives? How accurately were they remembered? Uh, there wasn't anyone sitting, listening to the word of the Buddha with great attention. So there's a bit different background to the narratives compared to the word of the Buddha himself. Uh, part of the narrative was remembered at the first recitation of the sutta, sometimes called the first council, uh, after the Buddha passed away. Uh, at that first council, it is asked specifically, where did this sutta happen? Who were the... Uh, you know, who was the protagonist, uh, uh, etc. And so the narrative part, yeah, the details about where things happened and who was present, uh, was actually laid down at the first council or after the time of the Buddha. And this gives you an idea how the narratives came about. Uh, so they are far less reliable, usually, than the actual content of the sutta, because they um, came later and they were added a long time after the events. Uh, All right. Dear Ajahn, I enjoy being brainwashed by you. Okay, excellent. Ha ha, got you. Now that is it. <laughs> by your teaching. Thank you again. In the Sutta, what does it mean? There is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. For example, in the Salayaka Sutta, Majjama 41. What it means is that generosity works. That's what it means, right? It means that when you give, you are actually progressing spiritually. There is an effect from these things. These things are not neutral. And this is an important point because there were teachers at that time who said giving is the action of a fool. Yeah, Who wants to give? That's kind of madness. Yeah, You're just kind of giving away what you could keep for yourself, right? So why? So actually it was necessary to make the point that these things are good karma. They make you feel better about yourself, they make good karma, they do things that are good for you on the spiritual path, etc, etc. And um, so that is, uh, again, the idea of right view yeah, that comes there. That is the worldly right view that is spoken of in the Salayaka Sutta in that particular context. Uh, so... Um, um, yeah, so uh, generosity is actually extremely important in Buddhism. Uh, it's very hard to overestimate the power of some of these very simple things. Uh, yeah? So be as generous as you possibly can in your life. Uh, yeah? If you have the opportunity to help out, to do something good, uh, take every opportunity. Uh, I've been very impressed at some of the people at our monastery in Perth. Uh, yeah? We have uh, some people who are extraordinarily kind and generous, always doing things for others. Yeah? <laughs> And they also get really good meditation. Huh? We have one Anagarika who helps everyone all the time, continuously. Huh? And he says he loves it. Huh? Yeah, he says, kind of get so much out of this giving all the time. Huh? Then he goes back to his cutie, and guess what? He gets good meditation. Huh? 
So it's this kind of willingness to always kind of, it's this incredible faith. Some people have this very, very powerful faith in the Dhamma and the Buddha. Huh? And he is like that. He has this extraordinary faith. Huh? Yeah, also in Ajahn Brahm, he's like kind of Ajahn Brahm devotee number one. Huh? And, he, and it's very sweet to watch. Yeah? It's, actually, it's actually very inspiring to see people like that. You think, wow, they really understand what is going on there. Huh? always providing services continuously throughout the day until he goes back to his cutie and then he kind of chills out and meditates. So, so uh, this is the kind of way you want to live if you really want to make the most out of this path. Uh, it's really, really nice. Anyway, dear Ajahn, are there also other forms of nimittas? Uh, are they absolute... Um, uh, necessary to get into jhanas? Uh, um, are they absolutely necessary? I do not wish to say yes or no to that question. I don't know. But uh, in my experience, it is usually the way in, and it is the way in the suttas they talk about nimittas. Uh, uh, and we'll have a look at one sutta later on. Uh, if we get, get there, it's going a bit slowly so far, but hopefully we'll get there. Uh, that actually talks about uh, these things. Uh, so I would say this is the standard way of entering a jhana state. Uh, and usually, if you haven't got it yet, it means that you just have to keep on developing. I mean, these are very profound things already. If you haven't got this in the nimitta, it, is not, it doesn't mean that you're a bad meditator. It just means that these things are very profound. But the way the word nimitta is used, it is used quite variously. So, for example, I mentioned before that it is used to uh, mean any kind of thing that you see in your mind's eye, yeah, any pictures, that kind of thing, they're often called nimittas, uh, and they are uh, interesting sometimes, but not all that useful. Uh, sometimes a nimitta can be a picture that you get up and it can have to do maybe with the future, uh, and maybe a prediction of the future. You see something in your mind's eye and you think, wow, that, that's interesting. Uh, there can also be lights in the mind that actually are devas. Uh, if you want to see a deva in your mind, it can look very much similar to the idea of a nimitta. Huh? Yeah, it's not, uh, not that different. Uh, uh, and you have to kind of know that kind of territory to, to distinguish the, the two between, uh, between the two. Huh? So all of these things are like lights in the mind of, of various types. Uh, but the samadhi nimitta, the thing that we are talking about here, really should be something like uh, the moon or the sun. It should be a simple light with a simple shape because that is what, and, and powerful, as powerful as possible, because that is what enables access into these very profound states. All right. The last one from yesterday. Uh, dear Ajahn, thank you for the inspiring talks. They go straight into my heart and ground my confidence in the path. What a wonderful thing to say. I'm really pleased to hear that. Uh, Excellent. I follow your recommendation to read the book after. It made me feel at ease about death. That's also very nice to hear. One thing I'm curious about is the negative experiences described. What is the Buddha's explanation for those negative experiences? Not asking out of fear, but curiosity. Okay, good. Uh, so the... the, the uh, Buddhist reply or the Buddhist view on that is basically that um, sometimes you may be heading for a difficult rebirth, right? Uh, depending on what karma ripens for you. Uh, and so that those negative experiences may be like the mind is kind of leaning in that direction. Uh, and then you kind of feel that you are dragged towards something negative and something, something difficult. Uh, and that is, uh, could be the, uh, quite likely, the, uh, the uh, negative experience. Uh, and there's much more of these things that is reported in that particular book. There are experiences that are very kind of, some people had very frightening experiences, like kind of being dragged to hell and these kind of things. And they kind of make it out and come back in time. They don't actually go to hell. And then they kind of start changing their conduct quite dramatically afterwards, yeah, because they kind of really frightens them when they see these realities. And so um, it shows you that uh, these negative bad rebirths, they also seem to be uh, possible. Yeah? It matches what we see in the suttas. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, that is another motivation for practicing the path. Uh. All right. I'm going a bit faster today because of all the questions in here. So let's see how far we get. Uh. 
Dear Ajahn, thank you for your edifying leadership. Leadership, all right, I don't feel much like a leader, but anyway, I'm talking a little bit. So, um, when I carry out household, household and washing vegetables, something and wash, washing vegetables, cleaning the floor, etc., household duty, no, no, yeah, anyway, I find my Self singing and songs from the old days and feeling happy, and not very mindful. There, <laughs> what is your opinion? Should I try to be mindful all the time and maybe or maybe a little mindless? <laughs> now, don't take these things too seriously, don't become a kind of super serious Buddhist. There are so many serious Buddhists in the world, right? And you wonder whether they're ever going to go anywhere on the path because they just don't seem to have any joy in life. Yeah, they seem so dry. That's kind of the real dry Buddhist, in my opinion. Uh, just and if you want to sing along a little bit, uh, that's all right. Remember the purpose of mindfulness here is to have a good mind state. Uh, and if you are enjoying what you're doing and you're singing along a little bit, uh, that is fine. Uh, yeah? don't, don't become too... Uh, uh, too perfectionist with these kind of things. Uh, if you see your mind becoming negative, then don't sing bad songs, right? That's maybe the, <laughs> the only thing you should kind of watch out for. So when you see the, kind of the bad songs coming out, then, uh, then be careful there. Uh. But uh, yeah, just en enjoy things, yeah? Have a good time and don't, don't take these things uh, too seriously. I sometimes say to people that when you had a long day and you come back from work, uh, yeah, don't sit down and meditate straight away. Yeah. Take a bit of time before you do your meditation so you have time to relax properly, have a cup of tea, put on some nice music, yeah. uh, you know, let's read something or, or whatever, go for a little bit of a walk or whatever. Yeah. But uh, it's okay even to listen to a bit of music. Yeah, again, why? Because uh, the sense pleasures come in a large variety. Yeah. And some of them are soothing. Some of them kind of lead you in the right direction. Uh, that's why we're talking about going for a walk in the forest. That's a kind of sense pleasure, but actually it leads the mind in the right direction. Uh, so it's about gradually bringing the mind down, making it calmer. Uh, and when you live in a sensory world, uh, it is okay to use more refined sensory uh, stimulus uh, to actually help you to calm down. Uh, so put on a bit of gentle music. Don't go, don't go heavy metal, right? But uh, <laughs> that's going to disturb you. But uh, something else. Uh, do people still listen to heavy metal? I don't know. I have no idea what's uh, going on in the music scene. But anyway. So, uh, next one. Dear Arjan, I support people remotely in difficult situations like war zones and oppressive regimes. Uh, these are not meditators or Buddhists. Uh, do you have a device on what I can say or do with them? Uh, to help them cope psychologically uh, with the situation they are in. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, all right, so uh, I guess what you can do is you can uh, do uh, remind them of these kind of very interesting stories that you hear sometimes about people in war zones uh, who actually find meaning uh, at that particular time. Uh, I heard so many stories of that, of people who said that actually during war they are more happy here than they are outside of war. Here. Because people work together, they have more compassion for each other, they put aside their differences, and somehow good qualities come out of being in a war zone. So uh, point, point that out to, to these people, right? That actually if you look around, this is maybe the opportunity to do good. To help, yeah, to have compassion, uh, and to see what they can do for their fellows around around them. Uh. That's one thing you can say, right? Because this seems to be a, quite a common experience. People actually getting something out of these very difficult things. Uh. The other thing to do is to remind people in difficult situations that the oppressors are not necessarily evil. Uh. Yeah, the oppressors are themselves oppressed in a certain way. Uh. Oppressors and uh, victims are kind of always changing around uh, and we are all oppressors and victims in this life. Uh, and so just try to make them see this from another point of view. This is not really Buddhist teachings. Uh, these are just general, you know, realities about the world. Uh, in fact, the Buddhist teachings are supposed to be a, a, a view of the world rather than some kind of ideology or some kind of... Uh, um, you know, doctrine which is not based on reality, it's supposed to be based on reality. So the Buddhist teachings should generally be applicable to other people as well, 
if you phrase them in a non-Buddhist way, yeah, yeah? having compassion, etc. Uh, so something like that, uh, something very simple uh, to make them kind of deal with it. And uh, of course, simple teachings like you know Ajahn Brahm's teaching of this too will pass teaching uh, is a very useful one. Uh, everything will pass. Uh, okay, so you do your best while it lasts, and then uh, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a way through. Uh, and uh, remind people that what matters in life is not what you experience, but what you do, uh, how you live, uh, using difficult situations for your benefit, uh, to do what is right and to live well. And if you are wise about difficult situations, you come out better at the other, the other end of things usually. Uh. So there's always a potential blessing for any difficult situation in life if you use it wisely. Uh. So. Yeah, something, something like that is easy to say and maybe not so easy to do, but uh, still, all you, you know, that's kind of your ability is to, to say something. So, uh, anyway, good luck. It's wonderful that you do this uh, and that you actually uh, help people out. This is kind of just another way of being generous and kind. That's, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ajahn, for the excellent explanation of the suttas. Question, what happens to consciousness once you become an arahant? Is the consciousness is an, uh, if the consciousness is an energy source? Uh, is consciousness an energy source? Maybe. Uh, consciousness is mental, right? And uh, the mind is not the same as physical things. And ordinary energy is just uh, is, phys- is is very closely related to matter, yeah, because matter and energy are interchangeable. So even though consciousness is energy in one way, it's a different kind of energy. I don't think it is the energy that physicists speak of, huh? and uh, so that energy can probably cease, yeah, because it's a different kind of energy. It's a, uh, Yes, it is true that ordinary energy in the world cannot really cease because it gets, gets transformed from one thing to another one. But here we're talking about the mind as a different thing. Yeah? So I reckon mind, minds can cease. Uh, according to dependent origination, when nama rupa ceases or sankara ceases, then vijnana ceases. Uh, vijnana is consciousness. Uh, so that's what, what happens. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, what your question is, what happens to once you become an arahant, right? So do you mean when the arahant dies, or do you mean when you become an arahant? If you mean when you become an arahant, all that happens is that your defilements are ended, no more defilements, yeah? And you have the insight into things, so the consciousness is purified, that's what happens when you become an arahant. But when the arahant dies, that's when everything comes to an end, everything kind of becomes cool right there. All right. Are there hard copy books you would uh, recommend for reading the suttas? Uh, if I'm new to this, which sutta collection should I start with first? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I, if you want the hard copy books, there is a book called uh, In the Buddha's Words. Uh, and it is an anthology of suttas and it is very nicely collected together thematically. And it is translated by the most famous of all Buddhist translators called the Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is a translator. And he's a very, very beautiful language, very well translated. He is, uh, he is really excellent. So I would recommend that one. It has nice introductions, nice notes at the back to help you as a study guide. And uh, it is an overall delight of a book, yeah. <laughs> so, in the Buddha's words by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is, the, uh, is what I would recommend to start with. And uh, once you have uh, uh, done that, I would also recommend you to read some of the verse books. Uh, Dhammapada is a very great good place to start. The Dhammapada, Dhammapada, D-H-A-M-M-A-P-A-D-A, Dhammapada. And the various translations, translation that you might want to look at is by a fellow called uh, uh, Gil Fronsdal. Gil Fronsdal, G-I-L, Fronsdal, F-R-O-N-S-D-A-L, I think, something like that, from Gil Fronsdal. That's, that's a nice translation. If you don't want to read, if, you have, if you're not necessarily um, 
if you are not too attached to hard copy books, you can also go on the internet to suttacentral.net and all of these things are available on that website, all of these books. Uh, <coughs> by various translators, uh, but primarily by uh, Bhante Sujato is the main translator there. Yeah. So start with that, and then when you have done all of that, then go to the Majjhimanikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, uh, and you can have, have a look at that. That's a bit more challenging, but uh, very interesting and uh, good fun, I reckon. Uh, that's where the Angulimala Sutta is, we just heard about. Uh, that is where the Ratapala Sutta is, I mentioned before uh, today. Uh, that is where the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search Sutta, is found. A uh, lot of very interesting suttas in that collection. Uh. All right. Dear Ajahn, I have noticed a yellow ring, then disc, uh, missed in front of me several times. Uh, it gets distant, uh, smaller, then disappears. Uh, uh, this happened several times during this morning meditation. I am sure I am not imagining. This occurred to me before and I thought this can't be the bright light. Uh, uh, explained uh, uh, to some Dhamma talks heard previously also. What am I experiences, experiencing is not bright. Uh, I thought it could be normal to see uh, like that when we keep the eyes closed. I tried it yesterday when I'm not meditating. I didn't see it. Uh, is it real? I'm absolutely sure it's real. It sounds very real to me. Am I imagining? Please kindly clarify. I think it may very well be the beginning of a nimitta. Yeah, nimittas come in various forms and shapes. They are not always bright. They often start out as not very bright, and then you can brighten them up over time. So this may very well be the beginning of a nimitta. How do you know? Well, the way you know is really what are the feelings that go with that image. If the feelings are peaceful, if you have a bit of joy and gladness as you see that, then quite likely it is the beginning of an imita. And it's a starting point. So what you should do then is just focus on that, stay with that to the best of your ability. If it is not stable enough, then go back to the breath. But if it is getting stable enough that you can stay with it, then just stay with that nimitta. Focus on the center of it and don't go to the edges. Enjoy the bliss, enjoy the peace. And as you do that, it will hopefully expand, get more steady, get brighter, get more um, unified, and all of these qualities will come, come from it. So to me, this sounds like the real deal. So uh, well done. It's actually it's wonderful to hear that people are getting some good results. So that's great. Dear Ajahn, please advise how to lead the best life as a layperson, least stressful. <laughs> okay, how to lead the best possible life as a layperson, be kind. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Be kind, be kind, be kind. And that is all you need to know. No, um, that is, <laughs> it is like really all you need to know. Uh, but being kind is often difficult. Uh, we lose our way a little bit. Uh, so to uh, inspire yourself, come back to the suttas, uh, come back to some good Dhamma teachings to inspire yourself, to enable you to actually be kind. Uh, because sometimes we lose the energy, we lose the oomph, uh, and then it becomes harder. You will find that if you change your attitude to life and you focus on the how rather than the what of life, uh, then if life becomes much less stressful. Uh, if you don't care about outcomes, if outcomes are completely secondary uh, and all your focus is on living in the right way, with kindness, with care, with compassion, uh, <coughs> actually much of the stress is taken out of it. Uh, the stress comes because we want outcomes. Uh, we want to meet deadlines. Uh, we want things to get done in the right way. Uh, if you think, okay, if I die, it's all right. If I lose my job, it's fine. If uh, the world kind of goes to the dogs, yeah, all right, no worries. Uh, as long as I'm kind, uh, that's all that matters. Uh. Yeah, so a bit more, not taking life so seriously, not taking the outcome so seriously, uh, not trying to control things too much, uh, and allowing things to go with the flow, knowing that the outcome is just so unreliable anyway. Uh, then life usually becomes less stressful. Uh. It's easy to say, sometimes it may be hard to do that, uh, and I recognize that. If you have kids, for example, you have children, uh, and they you know, need to be looked after, uh, and uh, that can often be stressful. Uh, and uh, jobs, uh, there are managers, and there are people who want you to get things done. Uh, but again, if you are not too concerned about uh, 
you know, getting promotions or getting a raise or even whether you get to keep your job. If you're not too concerned about those things, uh, then uh, yeah, people have less power over you uh, and you can do more what you feel is appropriate. Uh, like bringing cups of, cups of tea to your fellow workers. Uh, yeah, that's what you should really be spending the whole day. Just bringing cups of tea to your fellow workers. Uh, isn't that kind of a nice way of working? To me, that's kind of really beautiful. Uh, and um, yeah. All right, uh, next one. Dear Ajahn, could you please explain a little about the Buddha's view on walking meditation? Aha, okay, what do you find in the suttas? Uh, thank you for your encouraging teaching. So, there actually is very little in the suttas about walking meditation, surprisingly little. Uh, it just says occasionally that the Buddha or one of the monks or whatever, they walk back and forth, and that's it. That's all it says. It doesn't say what they do, what they focus on, or anything like that. So it is really up to us to make the most out of walking meditation. And it's usually the way it is traditionally done, kind of in the forest tradition, is that you have a kind of a stretch of ground that is flat and even, so it's easy to walk on, like the grass here or some of the paths or the room over there or whatever. And then you have a, maybe 20 steps is usually quite a good length. Some people say 30, some people say 20, whatever. It's also about the size of the place also matters, obviously. You don't have to be too rigid with that. And then you just walk back and forth. And the classic way is to kind of feel the feelings and the feet yeah, and focus on that. And that would be like a samatha kind of meditation to make the mind peaceful. Yeah. But very often when you've been sitting down and you've been trying to do samatha meditation, watching the breath, sometimes the mind needs a break from that. Yeah. You feel you have just come out of watching the breath. You need to do something different for a while before you do more calming of the mind. Yeah. So do something else, yeah? contemplate something. Yeah? Contemplate the uh, uh, message from the suttas that we've been talking about. Uh, contemplate death a little bit. Yeah? I mean, remind yourself, I'm going to die. What does that mean? Uh, could I die today, tomorrow? What might kill me? Okay, cars here, they're actually they're pretty civilized, the cars here, but uh, sometimes you get some rough driver, yeah? and this kind of, and then you don't know, yeah, or, or whatever, yeah? but you kind of, Remember that actually death is always a possibility here. Yeah. And so that is um, one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is just to do metta practice during your walking meditation. And this can be very simply that there are certain difficult people in your life and you've learned to look at them in a new way. Look at them more as victims of the conditioning yeah, rather than autonomous beings who really want to harm you. Yeah. If you look at other people as autonomous beings who want to harm you, guaranteed you're going to have ill will there. Yeah, because that kind of drives the ill will if they deliberately kind of are doing bad things to you because simply because they want to harm you and they're doing that because they want to, not because of conditioning, then there's no way you're going to be able to forgive them. Right? But if you see them more like victims, and I think we are all victims, uh, we're all conditioned. Uh, we don't, many things that we do in life that we would rather not do. Uh, we can do that in a walking meditation. Um, uh, uh, you can contemplate impermanence. Uh, Today we'll be looking at the idea of the Sabba Loka Anabhirati, Anabhirati Sanya, the non-delight in the whole world. And you can just think about the world. Actually, the world isn't that interesting. Yeah. Why am I so interested in the world? What am I getting out of all of these things? And you can become a little bit more cool about the five senses, the world of the five senses, and see if you can get more inspiration from Dhamma, from purifying your mind, from Dhamma practice, and kind of guiding your mind a little bit in that direction. Instead of seeing the events of the world as depressing, see them as an opportunity to let go of the world. Then we're using it in a positive way. Sometimes you can just walk back and forth doing absolutely nothing, just enjoying walking back and forth. The sun is out, you know, you are kind of in a beautiful place, you just enjoy the peace of being here. And you think, yay, hooray, what a wonderful thing. And you, yeah, and this is also beautiful, just the enjoyment of the place, because this brings up good qualities within uh, and allows you to enjoy what is going on more. Your meditation is guaranteed uh, going to improve if you have that kind of attitude. Uh. So sometimes you don't do anything. Uh, you just watch your mind. You see what's happening in my mind, and you understand your mind better. Uh. Okay, this, these are the problems I have. Yeah, These are the people I'm upset with. Okay, now I'm getting upset. Why am I getting upset? Okay, this reason. 
So you start to see, you have more clarity, more mindfulness because you're on retreat. In daily life, you may not be able to pick these things up because they're just too happens too fast. Uh, you get to know yourself better. So just walk back and forth, just seeing what's happening in your mind. Yeah, no control. Just allow things to flow. Uh, this is another thing that can be very useful. Uh, so all of these, um, all of these uh, things, there isn't really any. Anything you cannot do, actually, yes, there's a few things you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing yet. So, <laughs> but uh, you can be imaginative and you can do um, almost anything here. Yeah. The one thing you should not do, maybe, is watching the breath uh, while you walk in meditation because it's too refined. It's not recommended that you watch your breath at that time. Yeah. Okay. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your helpful and inspiring talk. So please, could you help? Clarify something for me. Yeah. Actually, I want to say one more thing about walking meditation. Yeah. And that is uh, something I learned from Ajahn Brahm, and that is to walk at a natural pace. Uh, uh, because if you try to walk very slowly and mindfully, uh, very often there is a lot of, a bit of force there, uh, a bit of willpower. Uh, and sometimes that uh, is, uh, again, the sort of thing that we're trying to move uh, away from. So walk quite naturally, that's what I would recommend. Uh. <laughs> Uh, please, could you help clarify something for me? The four kinds of noble ones uh, are straightforward. Uh, one becomes a stream enterer, one stream enterer, etc. But the eight pairs are trickier. If someone is on the path to stream entry, actually a noble one, yet because they haven't yet realized the fruit of stream entry, uh, yeah. So are the noble ones? Uh, they, they are considered noble ones, even though they haven't. Uh, achieve the fruit of stream entry, that's right. Uh, and it is said in the suttas that uh, they have to become a stream entry within this life. Uh, yeah, so if, once you're on the path, uh, you will become a stream entry whether you want to or not. Uh, and according to one commentary, which may be a little bit dodgy, they say that the universe will stop, come to a halt uh, if you haven't become a stream entry. The universe waits until you become a stream entry and then the universe carries on. Uh, <laughs> Why? Because if the universe crashes, you die. But you cannot die until you become a stream entry. The universe must wait, right? I, think, I don't know if that is very... It's a little bit weird to me. And I don't think that this should be taken maybe quite literally. But it's entertaining anyway. So the four paths, yeah? The path to stream entry is called the... What is it called? The Sotapati, Sotapati Pala Patipanno. Sotapatipanno person, the one who is practicing for the fruit of stream entry. So there's one, then there's the one who's practicing for the fruit of once returning, the one who's practicing for the fruit of not returning, the one who's practicing for the fruit of Aramahanship. So all of these have got to a point where it is irreversible, they will achieve that fruit during this lifetime. That's what this path idea seems to mean. So something happens in your mind. And it is not clear exactly what happens. It is not necessarily a clear event. Yeah? It may be an event, but it's not obvious to you. If you do become a stream enter, you know that you, something really happened, something really big happened, like the universe just got turned upside down. That's kind of stream entry for you. Yeah? Remember that the idea that what the Aryans see as a happy, the ordinary people see as dukkha. What the Aryans see as dukkha, the ordinary people see as happy. So they, basically your perception of the world is turned upside down, uh, and which is kind of fascinating. Uh. So stream entry is a big event. Uh, it is not to something small. But these other things uh, are far more uncertain. Uh. But you are indeed called a noble one, uh, uh, nevertheless. Uh, Okay, so, dear um, Ajahnar, thank you for a very inspirational retreat. At first it was challenging, but now I want more peace and insight. Yay! You mentioned there were deep inclinations of the mind. I want, I, what we really desire. Is there a way to cultivate an, an an inclination away from the world uh, if one still inclines towards worldly things. Uh, yes, there is, and that's exactly what we're doing on this retreat. Yeah? Almost all the things we're doing here, all the things we have been talking about, is precisely an inclination away from the world. Uh, 
Yeah, the idea of understanding death, of understanding old age, of understanding how the world is always unreliable, all of these things, if you contemplate them properly, will incline you away from the world and towards the spiritual path. Understanding the danger in things, how uncertain it is all. Yeah, and you, you start to move away from these things. Also, a brief question about monastic life. What does contact with family and friends look like? Are you allowed to visit? Thank you, Lord Um Yes, I'm actually on my way to visit my mum. Yeah, after, after the UK, I go to Norway to visit my mum, who lives by herself. And uh, so she is, uh, hopefully, I hope she's looking forward to it, otherwise I'll be there. <laughs> Why are you coming back? <laughs> No, I, I think no, she's definitely looking forward to it, so that's, that's really nice. And uh, so, yes, you are allowed to visit family, and depends a little bit on what kind of monastery you're in. All monasteries have their own ideas, their own kind of uh, little rules. But in our monastery, Ajahn Brahm, basically you can do whatever you want. That's our monastery. It's the whatever you want monastery here. It's very, <laughs> he's very kind of lenient. Yeah? It's, there's, there's very few things that he will not allow you to do as long as you keep your precepts and you are a kind and a good person. Uh, basically, you can do whatever. Uh, so he's very good like that. But it depends on the monastery. These things are not laid down in the monastic rules. Uh, there aren't any specific rules for these things. Uh, so it depends on uh, your uh, connection to your teacher, etc., etc. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, hi there. Okay, hi there. Hello. <laughs> In relation to age, one, uh, many of the people who donate to your organization are older, question um, mark. Yes, yes, they are not kind of the youngest people because the young people often don't have that much money to donate, so they tend to be at least a little bit older, not necessarily ancient, but uh, you know, uh, somewhere over a certain age. Many like, many like myself work to donate. Uh, your attitude to aging, in my opinion, enforces negative attitudes. Fifty years old, which can make it difficult to secure employment. Uh huh. Okay. Mm. Um. Yeah. I, yeah, it's not really about. Uh, I, I, maybe you haven't quite understood what the point was. I'm not sure. Uh, because the point is not really to have a negative opinion about people who are getting older. The idea behind what I was saying today is just to turn your mind towards the spiritual path, to make the spiritual path easier. That is kind of the point, right? Uh, so the idea is that when you become a little bit less interested in the world, uh, you become more interested in the spiritual life. It's to enhance your ability to practice the spiritual path. That is really the point. Uh, so it is not uh, to kind of have negative attitude towards all people. In fact, I would say the opposite. Yeah, we should have a lot of uh, gratitude for the elders in our society and everything, and be kind to them. And we should not just because someone is old doesn't mean that they cannot be employed. In fact, uh, we should probably employ all people more. I would reckon. Uh, and if all people want to work, it often gives meaning in life and purpose, uh, and often they have insights and understanding that other people don't have. I think it's good, and I think we should probably encourage that. So I think that wasn't exactly the... I, I don't recognize myself as having said that, but anyway, if I, if I did, then, uh, uh, I, then maybe I made a mistake. Yeah. Number two, I'm 66 and about to donate a kidney which will last the recipient in excess of 10 years, uh, considerably longer, according to the surgeon. Uh, aren't bodies wonderful there? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you use your body in a good way, that's wonderful, right? So you use that to do a donation like this, that is great. And I, it is very commendable, and so I would certainly encourage you to do that, and that's a wonderful thing you're doing. Yeah. Whether well, bodies as such are wonderful, it really depends on your perspective. Yeah? If you can find something that is more wonderful than the body, yeah, then the body loses some of its shine because you have something higher. Yeah? Yeah, that's kind of the point of the spiritual path. Yeah? The body becomes less interesting yeah, when you achieve something better, if you know what I mean. Yeah? That is kind of the point here. Yeah? 
Number three, in my opinion, your attitude to aging and sickness does not encourage people to take responsibility for their own health. Uh, again, the idea is to not to not take responsibility. Uh, the idea is to encourage a spiritual path. This is the purpose of all of these things. Uh, yeah, remember the Buddha went forth because of this. Uh, he still looked after his body. This is about balance. Uh, and uh, I think you are taking this a bit the wrong way, if I may say so. Uh, and uh, you, uh, it is, it's about doing both at the same time, using it for spiritual uh, practice and also at the same time to look after the body. Uh. Number, five, number four, the consequence of this, I would argue, is that resources have to be taken away from those with long-term and or acute conditions. Uh, uh -huh. Ooh. Okay, the concept is it should be taken away from those with long term and or acute conditions. So, are you saying that that should be done, or are you saying that's a consequence of what I say here? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't think that is what uh, I'm trying to say. Yeah, we, we want to uh, support people who are sick, etc., and uh, uh, whatever. So, I, what I would recommend is that. Um, Instead of taking what I say too seriously and, uh, you know, maybe becoming concerned about it, uh, use these things for reflection. Uh, you know, they're there for reflection. If you don't like it, that's fine. Uh, you can put it to one side. Uh, it's not there to kind of, uh, meant to kind of uh, annoy you or make life difficult for you or whatever. Uh, take it just as an idea and see if you can work with it. Uh, and if it doesn't make any sense to you, check it out. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Uh, my purpose here is not to kind of force anyone to think in a certain way or whatever. The purpose is just to kind of open up new doors, new avenues uh, to think about the world. And if those doors don't work for you, it's perfectly okay. They're meant for reflection. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate that you disagree. Perfectly fine to disagree. I have no problems with that at all. Um, but uh, also try to reflect a little bit because you may find that there is some, something very interesting going on here. After all, if the Buddha used this as his reflections for becoming enlightened, to become the Buddha, then it is pretty powerful, right? There must be something interesting going on as well. Eh? So try just gently to see if there might be something to this. Okay, next one. Dear Master, could you speak a bit about human beings living up to and more than 80 thousand years during some stages of the eon. Please, uh, how to make sense of this, etc. Also, Gary Panta could let us know about what happened after the fire at Bodhidharma Monastery. Did it all get destroyed or miraculously survived? <laughs> Thank you so much for the very inspiring teachings there. Okay, so the, the, this is interesting. Yeah, they said that the human lifespan fluctuates from five years uh, or ten years uh, all the way up to 84,000 years, something like that. Uh, and of course, we're talking here about enormous time uh, scales, yeah? eons. Uh, and within an eon, these fluctuations happen. Uh, and uh, so I think that the, what is going on there is that the kind of the various levels of existence, like the human level, whole, the whole level fluctuates. Uh, so when uh, sometimes humans become more like devas, uh, we become closer to the deva loka, our bodies become more refined. Uh, yeah, and we are closer in existence to maybe the next uh, level up, like the four great king, Devaloka, the Maha. Uh, my mind is a bit uh, mushy right now, but anyway, with the next level up. Uh, and so it's like we fluctuate physically and mentally, uh, and we are not the, the realms are not exactly the same. There's very high degree of impermanence going on and things changing here. Uh, so if you have this kind of physical body, 84,000 years would be really problematic, right? Uh, don't know what you would look like after even a thousand years, and let alone 84,000 years. Uh, it would be pretty scary. But um, uh, so I think there is a different kind of body that is going on. I think that is why this is possible. Uh, that is my theory, and it may not be correct. Uh, and what happened to the, uh, the fire body now? What happened, of course, was that even though everyone thought it was going to burn down, it did not burn down. Yeah? I forgot to say that. Uh, it did not burn down, and so they went back, and there was one kuti that was burnt a little bit on the corner of one kuti, and there was a dodgy monk staying in that kuti. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are, that's what happens when you are dodgy, your kuti might burn down. 
<laughs> that's the story I heard from Ajahn Ram anyway. So, <laughs> okay. So let us go on to the next one. Dear Bhante, is there really much less conflict between people in monastic life? It seems to still be with some kind of hierarchy. Is seniority based on years of practice or depth of meditation or knowledge of suttas or some other skills? Thank you. A hierarchy in monastic life, uh, it varies enormously which monastery you are in. Some have very strict hierarchies, other monasteries are pretty flat. Uh, but generally it is, has to do with seniority, how long you have been a monastic. It yeah? got nothing to do with your practice or the depth of meditation or whatever, because these are so uh, subjective uh, yeah, very hard to know what is going on with someone. The only thing that is reasonably objective is the, how long you've been a monk, yeah? how many years, etc. So that is usually the hierarchy. So you sit according to seniority, for example, in, when you sit in line and these kind of things. Uh, but uh, in many monasteries, there is, you know, some monasteries like Bodhinyana doesn't really feel like much of a hierarchy. Uh, yeah. And uh, Ajahn Brahm is not the kind of hierarchy kind of person at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone is really more like friends, uh, etc. Uh, so it's not, but it depends where you are. I mean, some countries, the culture of the country is very hierarchical. Uh, and so then that culture in the country makes itself felt also in the monastic Sangha. Uh, so, for example, Thailand is quite a hierarchical society. Uh, so then when you go to a monastery, you can feel the hierarchy. Uh, you don't really question the senior monastics. Uh, yeah? It's considered rude in that sort of society. Uh, Whereas in Bodhinanda Monastery, everyone questions Ajahn Brahm, right? So because, because this is kind of what we do, yeah, and that's perfectly fine. And in fact, I think it's a very healthy thing yeah, that you're allowed to question and etc. etc. Yeah. So it depends on the on all of these kind of uh, cultural things and where you are and who you're with, etc. Yeah. But uh, generally I am not not very fan of hierarchy myself. Uh, and uh, no way where I Hail from is a very flat kind of society, a very non-hierarchical. So that's kind of what I have, what I'm used to. Uh, is there less conflict between people in monastic life? Um, it depends. Usually, I would say yes, because everyone tends to be at least in a good monastery. People are serious about the practice, so they try not to have conflict. At Bodhinyana Monastery, actually, very very little conflict. To be honest with you. Very rare that we have any major disagreements between people. Um, and um, one of the reasons why that is the case is because you have a powerful figure like Ajahn Brahm at the top, yeah? someone everyone really respects and someone who kind of sets the tone for the rest of the monastery. Yeah? That is incredibly helpful. Yeah? So it depends on the leadership, if you like, or the senior monastics, uh, how good they are, how well practiced they are. Yeah? you know, for how the rest of the community functions. And uh, so, but at Bodhinana Monastery, I would say it is remarkably uh, harmonious. Uh, not perfect, because people are still people, uh, but uh, surprisingly harmonious. Dear Arjan, you mentioned that if you are disturbed by other mind objects when you are doing the breath meditation uh, to make the breath interesting. I yeah. hope I understood some something. Um, uh, please tell me a few ways of making it interesting. Yeah. Also meta. So interesting means that uh, it means usually means that it is a joyful object, right? It is happy, yeah. and so you make it interesting by having a sense of meta towards the breath, seeing your breath as a friend. All of these things are kind of perceptions that you use to make it more attractive to be with your, your breath. Uh, if you see the breath as, yeah, yeah, same old boring breath, there's no way you're going to be able to watch it, uh, yeah, because you are already fed up before you start. Uh, so you have to make it, uh, make it nice. Yeah, okay, the breath has there, it has supported me for so long, uh, maybe I should support it back a little bit and have kindness towards it, uh, and these kind of things. Uh, and then uh, you kind of make it interesting. But uh, the main way of making it interesting is the sutta we have just started looking at this afternoon. Yeah? The idea of uh, having the recollection of the Buddha, recollection of your kindness or your practice, recollection of your generosity, and these kind of things. Uh, that is really the way to make the breath interesting. So you use those recollections uh, and you bring those into the breath meditation. Uh, 
So you give rise to joy, huh? and then you go to the breath, and then you kind of bring them together. Huh? And this is how you can make the meditation very powerful, huh? make the breath very interesting. Huh? So, um, yeah, so something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I hope that helps. Let's so see how it goes. Huh? Creativity versus artists. Could you please tell us a bit uh, more what the Buddha said? Uh, thank you. Um, he does, it is not a topic that really is so much uh, uh, spoken about in the suttas, yeah, creativity. Um, trying to kind of think how it might relate to something on the on the path, uh, I uh, don't uh, don't know if it is really talked about all that much. But um, uh, I guess I think a creative mind is always useful, yeah, because a creative mind means it, and maybe an open mind it means a mind that is able to be flexible and to look at things in new ways, uh, right? Uh, so I think you can use that, for example, by you know thinking about the world, for example, the, as impermanent. Yeah, understanding the world according to the world. You can use your creativity to kind of think about the world, get some more insight into how the world actually is. Uh, you can use your creativity to de develop some of these perceptions the Buddha is talking about. Yeah, how do you develop them? People use different ways of doing this. Whatever feels natural to you. Uh, so. Um, I don't think it is directly talked about as such, but I think it's obvious that it is an important part of the practice. Uh, I remember it was a very interesting quote by Albert Einstein, uh, and he said something to the effect that uh, the most important aspect of intelligence uh, is imagination or creativity. Uh, right? Uh, so, uh, because this is what allows you to see things in new ways, getting out of your habits. Uh, and a very important part of the Buddhist practice is to get out of our habits uh, and seeing things in new ways. And that will take a degree of flexibility, I suppose, and, and creativity and imagination. Uh. Dear Ajahn, thank you for bringing uh, the Buddha and the Dhamma alive uh, to the modern world. Uh, Loving explanations and the retreat, Sadhu times three. Yeah, so inspirational. In question, in the meditation, when you have left the body yeah, and uh, uh, with the mind, what actually happens there? Yeah. Um, the term mental objects, uh, uh, not what exactly does what uh, what exactly does that mean? Uh, is this not the th is this the third tetrad equivalent to the third stage of satipatthana? Yes. Also, if you are left uh, with uh, just the mind, the awareness only, does this disappear only after seeing uh, the insights of impermanence, disenchantment, dispassion? Uh, Finally, is this letting go, the letting go of the consciousness awareness itself? Uh, finally, when does the consciousness come back? Uh, what happens uh, when you have no consciousness, uh, hopefully not dead? Uh, do you first continue, uh, uh, sit up in silence or asleep? <laughs> okay, uh, till you regain consciousness after a whole long. So, okay, so, so the... Uh, Come back to the Anapanasati Sutta because that makes it very clear what is going on. Yeah? So the third Satipatthana is the contemplation of the mind. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, sorry, yeah, in the, in the Satipatthana Sutta it says that you know various kinds of mind states. Yeah? You know a mind with greed, a mind without greed, a mind with ill will, a mind without ill will, a mind with delusion, a mind without delusion, a, a mind that is contracted, uh, yeah, usually means like sloth, tiredness, lethargy, a mind that is uh, restless, uh, vikitta, it is kind of spread uh, going all, you know, all over the place. Uh, then you have the mind that is mahagata, which means gone become large. Then you have the anuttara mind, which is the unsurpassed mind. You have the, um, you have the freed mind. Uh, vimutta, I think it is. Vimutti or something. Vimutta chitta, vimutta chitta I think. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the vimutta chitta there. I think vimutta is the Anapanasati Sutta. I think the Satipatthana is vimutta chitta, I think. Yeah. 
Uh, and then there is one more, which escapes me now, in there. So you can see it's a very mind in various, uh, with various qualities of what we're trying to kind of to understand. It is not clear from the Satipatthana Sutta what the context for understanding is. Yeah? How do we actually uh, do this? Uh, and that context becomes quite clear in the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, you watch the breath, uh, you come to the mind uh, when the nimitta arises, you know that is the mind because the senses and the body are gone. So what you're left with is really just the mental thing, the mental aspect. Uh, so that is the mind. Uh, yeah? And then you learn about the mind through the bliss and through the peace uh, that you practice in the Anapanasati Sutta. And those negative qualities that are there in the Satipatthana Sutta, again, you learn about those, you understand them through their absence. Uh, because when they are gone, that is really when you can fully understand those, uh, those qualities. Uh. So that is how it works. Yes? The mind here basically means like a bright light or something uh, that you see. That is like the reflex of the mind or something to that effect. Uh. That is what you follow. Uh. That is what you're with. And that then, eventually, that light also disappears. Uh. And that is where you kind of get what is called ekanta, or unification, full unification of mind. The duality is gone. Yeah? The duality of me over here, the object over there, it all merges into one single experience. And that is an ajana experience. So, um, um, yes, then you are asking about consciousness and awareness only. Um, but there is no awareness only. All awareness has an object. Yeah, there's always something that you are aware of. There's no such thing as pure awareness in its own right. So sometimes you are just aware of infinite space, for example, and that's kind of uh, you know that's so it becomes very subtle after a while. When does awareness disappear? Well, awareness. Uh, uh, there's a this difference between understanding awareness as impermanent uh, yeah, and this awareness disappearing. Yeah? Because you, not all knowledge is direct by seeing the object. Uh, some knowledge is what you would call inferential knowledge. Uh, you understand it because you see, have seen enough to understand the general trend in the nature of the mind. Uh, you understand that consciousness must be impermanent because you have seen certain aspects of consciousness disappearing. Then you make the inference, the rest also is impermanent. Yeah, and you it doesn't actually have to be via, via the consciousness. You can understand the impermanence via feelings. Yeah, feelings are, are an easier target sometimes to understand impermanence through. And then you kind of consciousness comes along for the ride, if you like, and you understand the impermanence of consciousness. So understanding is impermanence does not mean that it stops. It is more an insight based on the information that you have already without it stopping. But it is possible, nevertheless, for consciousness to stop. There is a state called Sanya Vedaita Niroda, which means a cessation of what is felt and what is perceived. And that, in that state, consciousness ceases. So you just, you know, there's nothing you can do when that ceases, so you kind of you sit there. I'm not sure if it's you anymore, if consciousness is gone, I'm not sure what it is, it's the body sitting there. And then uh, when the kind of the mind kind of restarts again, because the momentum of that stopping is finished, uh, then the mind restarts uh, and you come out of it. Uh, and that is supposed to be the most peaceful, sublime experience possible when you come out of that state where everything has stopped. Uh, that's when you understand that stop, complete stopping uh, is the greatest thing that can happen to you. Uh. So it sounds... Strange, perhaps, uh, but that is what the Buddha says in the suttas. Uh, there is a nice sutta. This is, this is the Mara Tajaniya Sutta, Majmalikai 50. Uh, and it's this during a previous Buddha. And during this previous Buddha, there was one of his main disciples, right? They, I can't remember their names. I think some, one of them was called Sanjiva, the survivor. Maybe it was Sanjiva. So Sanjiva, he was meditating in the forest. Uh, very skilled meditator. Yeah? He was one of the chief disciples of the previous Buddha. And he goes into this state I was talking about, Sanya Vedaita Niroda, where everything comes to a halt. Now, if you see a person like that, you think they are dead, right? Because there's no breathing going on, there's nothing going on, everything is completely still. 
You don't need to breathe because your metabolism has come, gone to zero. If your metabolism has gone to zero, you don't need oxygen anymore. So your blood oxygen stays the same all the time. That's why you don't have to breathe then. So, uh, and you sit like that for a few days, yeah, and then you come out and you kind of do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but what happened to this particular monk? He's sitting in the forest uh, and then two people come by and they, and they are collecting firewood or something, yeah. And as they are coming by, collecting firewood, they see this monk, and they say, oh, look, there's a dead monk over there. Yeah, he's, there's nothing happening, he must be dead. So let's give him a nice funeral. So they build a funeral pyre, yeah, because they have all the sticks, when they're collecting sticks, they're big, 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 and they put the monk on top. And then they light it, and they walk off. And then the next morning, there is Pindavat. The Pindavat is when the monks go for arms around, uh, and they kind of put a bit of rice, and put a bit of food into each monk. Uh, and then suddenly, there is something about the monk that they recognize. They look up. This is the monk they burned yesterday. He had just come back for Pindavat. Uh, is this the ghost of this monk, or what is going on? Uh, and uh, the idea there is that if you have reached a state like that, uh, uh, you can't be touched anymore by fire and these kind of things, uh, yeah? So because the power of the mind, or the power of the stillness of that state, uh, it's so powerful that the body is kind of beyond being touched. Uh, and so the next morning you just go and pin the mat as if nothing happened. Uh, that's kind of extraordinary. Is that true or not? Uh, I don't know. It's a story. It's not really core Dhamma, so I, I wouldn't... It's possible that it's not true, I don't really know, but sometimes weird things aren't are true in this world, so I'm not entirely sure if it is uh, just a story here. Anyway, so that uh, I hope that answers a little bit of what you are asking. If not, please feel free to ask to try again, and we'll answer some more uh, after or later on tomorrow or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, we're actually doing quite well. This is marvelous. I might leave one question for tomorrow. So. Uh, <laughs> Because it's kind of becoming a habit now, leaving a few questions, so we've got to keep to, tradi to tradition. So, so uh, dear Ajahn, is there a reason why you refer to kindness instead of compassion? Uh, thank you so much for your energizing talks. So far, they are really energized my mind. Uh, one more question, what is the difference between perception and mental formation? So, so compassion is one kind of kindness, uh, right? Uh, Compassion is when you see someone in suffering and you want to help them, and you want to do something good. That's what compassion is. But there are other kinds of kindness. You can be kind to people who are not suffering as well. You can be kind to anyone, really, in the whole world. And so kindness is a broader term. It encompasses all the good acts that you do towards anyone. That is the distinction between the two, how I use them. Um, perception and mental formations are actually quite different things. So mental formations is a terrible translation because nobody can possibly understand what it means. How can you understand mental formations? Something that is forming in the mind. But um, at least for me it has always been very hard to really get my head around that particular term. And so I wrote to Bikki Boy and said, please, in the Anguttonic, I change your translation because I've been a monk for 20 years. I don't know what it means. And if I don't know what it means, surely no one else knows what it means either. And so he actually did change it. And in the Anguttonic, it is called mental activities. And that is much easier to understand than mental formations in my view. So mental formations really refers to the will. Yeah, it refers to the choices, the decisions, the will, the doing within us. Uh, that is what it refers to. Uh, and uh, it is not easy to necessarily get that out of the word uh, mental formation. So, uh, the reason why they use such a complicated term is because they're trying to encompass many different meanings into one translation. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea, but that's really the, the reason why it becomes so complicated. Perception, on the other hand, is how we recognize things in the world. Yeah? It's your ability to see things. Uh, yeah? How you know that person, uh, mat, carpet, curtains, window, yeah? building, friend, enemy, ideas as well come into that. Uh, this is what enables us to make distinctions and uh, enables us to make sense of the world. That's perception. So one is will, uh, the other one is like sense-making, if you like. Yeah? Okay, it has just turned uh, 9.30, so I will uh, stop there. Uh, 
and I will wish you uh, once again a very good night. Uh, please keep on enjoying yourself, uh, and we'll see you back again tomorrow morning. Let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, as we normally do at the end. Sangha Namah